I couldn't give a fig about the nuts and bolts of cameras and all the technology that goes into making a photograph or video. Those components, to me, are simply impediments on the road to creating visual equivalents, whether that means a YouTube video, digital image, or a fine art print. But those impediments must be mastered, or at least understood enough to navigate. I know that to some people, the nuts and bolts themselves are of great interest, how they were forged, <laughs> molded, machined, and polished. And some people are concerned with alloys down to the molecular level. And all these are, of course, created by people who operate, it seems to me, at the level of alchemists. Hi, Dr. Uh, <laughs> Ray here. I guess this video might naturally fall into the fireside chat category, except I don't have one of those um, gas patio heaters. And believe me, I kind of need it today. It's been raining down my neck. And after shooting and editing an epic technical review, I wanted to get out of the studio. Anyway, I'm glad you could join me as I endeavor to explain why I don't care about camera technology, at least not for its own sake. I fall somewhere in the middle of the geek scale. I'm the same with cars. Now, I can pull a bicycle apart and rebuild it from scratch, but when it comes to the internal combustion engine, well, that's another thing. I'm not incapable of turning a wrench, and I once rebuilt the top end of a 287 Chevy engine, due entirely to <laughs> financial factors. I couldn't afford to take it to the garage, at least not without spending the money I'd saved for a planned photo trip to Big Sur. Otherwise, I'd rather someone else get their hands greasy. And today's computerized vehicles pretty much fall into the same category as cameras. I want a car to get me from A to B, so I can make photographs or go shopping. I take it in for its biannual checkup, so it presumably runs well, and I take it for service if some other unexpected problem arises. I even have the <laughs> mechanic change between winter and summer tires. I must book that appointment, actually. It's June already, although you'd never believe it from the weather. I'm one of those people who, if a car is making a weird noise or doesn't start, <laughs> I open the hood and stare at the engine as if <laughs> that might help. Same with today's cameras. Actually, I've found most cameras I've ever owned over the last five decades to be amazingly durable and uh, reliable. You might take it from the content on this channel that I'm interested in or even obsessed with all things, photographically speaking, technical. But as per my opening disclaimer, nothing could be further from the truth. My approach to photography is more akin to superstition. I still see photography as say, like a, a lost tribe <laughs> might have seen an arriving ship or the overflight of a plane. Especially with these algorithm-driven and photon-dependent devices we now use to record our world. Sure, I read technical manuals, essays, and reviews, and perhaps in that sense I'm unique. I retain a certain amount of curiosity for the arcane workings of stacked sensors, though I've actually forgotten all that I read about those a few months back. Just as I used to study in books, already out of print in the 1980s, uh, the effect of, say, phenodone developer on silver bromide. Phenodone wasn't and isn't as toxic as metal and doesn't cause dermatitis on contact. <laughs> and it boasts up to 10 times the developing power of other developers, just so you know. So I guess this example also illustrates how Today's technology becomes yesterday's technology, but we still have the challenge in creating. So we're back to the discussion of gear versus creativity that keeps rearing its head. And I've explored it in some detail before, in a two-part series, no less. But I don't want to belabor that. And I certainly don't want to use it like some channels do, as a kind of view down the nose, if you will, of those of us who do make videos on the tools of the trade. Okay, so <laughs> in case you're wondering, then what the hell is the point of this video? I'll try and explain. I think it's important to understand, if not at the molecular level, as in my car or film photography metaphors, then certainly enough to become a craftsperson. Let's go back to the automobile metaphor. A Formula One driver needn't know how to build his car 
to be able to pilot it to a win. But he must train all his senses around and know what all the controls do. I recently watched a fascinating video on this platform about the uh, creation of a Formula One race car. Holy smokes! I had no idea just how much goes into getting a car over the finish line. It's akin to putting an astronaut in space complete with a control room full of technicians relaying data in real time, everything from the vital signs of the driver to the equivalent data from the car. Absolutely amazing. Is it possible to impart any kind of blueprint for creative success in photography to develop or encourage or open a photographic eye? Well, yes and no. I mean, I really think, in my experience anyway, talk is just talk. You can watch as many YouTube videos, or as we used to, read as many books and magazines, fill your head with all the philosophy, <laughs> and yet be a no better photographer than you were the first time you ever held a camera in your hand. In fact, you may be a lot worse off. Personally, I don't know if I've made any better photos than those I made with my Kodak Brownie in my early teens, when I uh, simply pointed my camera at things, people, places, cars, that interested me. These questions make me think of the philosophy of a man who became an unwitting spiritual leader, Jiddu Krishnamurti. At the risk, um, and it's a very great risk, <laughs> of mangling his ideas, Krishnamurti warned against following any teaching that led into orthodoxy, any recipe, theory, doctrine, practice, that led away from the core of who you are. He was a sort of uh, anti-guru. I was about 19 when I ran into his writing. I think it was via Aldous Huxley, because Aldous Huxley and his wife Laura were friends with Krishnamurti. And immediately, in contrast to so much of the New Age claptrap that was popular with the flower children of the time, his observations seemed self-evident rather than arcane, obtuse, or mystical. You know, that kind of stuff that still tries to convince acolytes that it's so mysterious and inexplicable that there must be some kind of wisdom <laughs> buried within. And people align themselves, perhaps, to appear as if they're among the initiated. No, uh, Krishnamurti talked simply about barriers to self-knowledge. How we flock to every kind of distraction. Books, radio, television, religion to avoid spending a moment with ourselves. And by doing so, we move away from who we actually are. Today, obviously, we'd add perhaps what may be the greatest distraction in history, the internet, where we gather in tribes to amuse, to search for information, solutions, belonging, <laughs> community, confirmation, or a good argument, <laughs> where our search for meaning is directed by algorithms that few of us understand or are even aware are shaping our thoughts and supplying our answers. Okay, before I get too deep into the weeds here and lose <laughs> more of my audience, let's bring this back to the subject at hand, such as it is. I can only speak from my perspective informed by my experience. I'm this guy on the internet. You ended up here because you've shown interest in my content, subscribed to my channel, hit the <laughs> notification bell, used Google search, which is part of the great electric archive. That's a term that I wrote in 1973, part of a poem. So I've been wondering about this for a long time. And you're probably here for any of the reasons I mentioned, or maybe another reason not anticipated by me, photography related or not. And I'd love it if you let me know in the comments below why you're here. Because I don't have a philosophy for you. I don't have any answers. I thought I did when I was younger, and arrogant enough to think so. When I began to see photography as some kind of tool to express my being, my click, <laughs> therefore I am, and then a way to pay the rent, I filled notebooks with exposure records, no EXIF data then, lens choices, film types, developer ratios, and uh, I Ching quotations. I bought uh, technical books, or I lent them from the library, I collected magazines, read the biographies and autobiographies of famous photographers, and countless essays on the history of this amazing visual art. But it needs to be said that my other interests, 
poetry, painting, drawing, uh, psychology, all the arts, had a tremendous influence on my camera work. Well, I've wandered all over the map again in this chat, vlog, whatever it is, and, and I'm not sure I've given you anything of interest or value. Everything here is to be taken in very general terms. But I guess I'm saying that I can't possibly throw any light on how you should approach your photographic journey, your um, Tao. Anyone who says they can is a, a false prophet. So really, though there is no perfect camera, certainly no ultimate brand, I still feel more honest offering opinions on gear, gear that is secondary to the zen of photography, than offering some formula for creative success. For better or worse, I've dedicated a great part of my life to photography. Like most intense endeavors, photography is give and take. It's given me much uh, in return for my labors, and it's also demanded a great deal. Sometimes I question how much of my life I've invested. Photography is, after all, a practice. And I mean that in the same way Buddhists use the term. And uh, as an anecdote to illustrate, 33 years ago, I attended a meditation retreat. At the end of the third day, breathing, watching thoughts go by, or more often recycle, probably all the initiates were anticipating the end of this long zazen, as these things are called. The moment when we would be freed from <laughs> uncomfortable poses, isolated with our thoughts, maintaining the straight back, head and shoulders, breathing, not long to go, thinking, the hell is going on upstairs, thinking, because there was a, a, a scraping of chairs and muffled voices from the floor above, a brief silence, a few of us shuffled searching for a comfortable position. The bell, it's got to sound any minute now, thinking. Instead, like this cacophony of trumpets, bassoons, trombones, and timpani erupted from upstairs. An amateur brass band were practicing, some out of tune, out of meter. But it was the most wonderful music I'd ever heard, and everyone else in the room seemed to get it as well. We're all amateurs with poor timing, imperfect tone, bad instruments, struggling to follow the meter of our breath, maybe make some music along the way. We're all practicing. Everyone fell literally from their cushions, laughing, oompa, oompa, and then the tinkle, tinkle of the Hosensho bell. The effect was so profound that, that some of us wondered if the lesson hadn't been prearranged, but it was just synchronicity. A scheduling conflict, I guess, had turned into a perfect meeting of moments. I wonder if those self-conscious music students had any idea the effect their music had and how well they actually played that day. And I hope they didn't uh, <laughs> hear our laughter and take it for ridicule. I don't have a prescription for success and certainly no recipe for excellence in the photographic sphere or anywhere else. If I have any consistent process over the years, it's throwing away <laughs> like 90% of what I create and uh, starting over. But the influential New York art critic, Jerry Saltz, recently posted a note to his um, Instagram. Artists, you do know, don't you, that your mistakes are your style. Now that just might be the last word on this subject. If you found this video useful, please give it the old thumbs up. If this is your first time here, please consider subscribing to my channel. Hit that notification bell so you don't miss a thing. In the meantime, take care of yourself. Cheers. We'll see you later.